On this edition of Independent Sources, I word victory, a major win for one racial justice group, but why is one national newspaper not on board? Where I'm from, taking the city's ethnic diaspora to the airwaves. And Style Mobile, a former city bus driver brings her own finesse to fashion in Harlem. Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Diana Ravinka. And I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. There's power in words. As journalists, we know that. So it was that sentiment that led the Applied Research Center, ARC, to begin their Drop the I Word campaign in 2010. The racial justice think tank argues that the word illegal has become somewhat of a racial slur and has contributed to certain members of society becoming marginalized. Their campaign led to much debate, even on this show, about what words should be used instead of illegal to describe undocumented immigrants. Just recently, the ARC won a major victory when the Associated Press agreed to drop the word from their star book. I spoke to the executive director of the ARC, Rin Sen, about the campaign's success and why at least one major newspaper has still not dropped the I word. Rinku, you've been quoted saying that immigrants have had a bit of their humanity restored. How big a victory is this? This is an enormous victory from the Associated Press. People have been working to take the language of illegality out of descriptions of immigrants for some 30 years. The National Hispanic Media Coalition, the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, the, Bla the Association of Black Journalists, Native American journalists, all of them have taken positions on this language. And we've been working on the campaign ourselves for about two and a half, almost three years. And so many really decades of work put in. Our campaign was designed to bring the voices of actual immigrants as well as journalists into the debate so that people who really had to live under the shadow of that language had a chance to say to the American public and to the press, what it is like, what effect it has on their lives. And what made this particular campaign successful this time? I think that it was the combination of an inside-outside strategy. So the journalists have been working from inside newsrooms, inside the press for many years, but there really hadn't been an outside the press strategy in which immigrants uh, in a concentrated way, in a national way, were really able to insert their voices into the debate and were able to say directly to news outlets what they were feeling. We have been working, for example, with a group of high school students in Charlotte, North Carolina, who are young, undocumented immigrants themselves, and they experience the word as a bullying cudgel, as something that is used against them on the schoolyard, in, in their communities, in their neighborhoods. So being able to give, provide a space for those people, young people, people who, are, um, who either are immigrants themselves or who are friends and uh, family members of immigrants to be able to make the same demand, that's what I actually think made the difference. Was the Associated Press a news outlet that uh, the campaign lobbied to, to reach out to in particular? Yes, it is. We chose the Associated Press as a key institution because it is so influential in the American media. It is a wire service. Its uh, stories are re reprinted thousands of times in newspapers across the country. And its style book, the Associated Press's style book, is really uh, used by the majority of uh, news organizations to figure out how it should talk about various things. And so to have illegal immigrant come out of the style book after decades of being in there is just a very high leverage move by the Associated Press. And how reflective is the Associated Press of the public opinion on the drop of the, on the issue of uh, dropping the, the word illegal? 
Well, I wouldn't say that the entire American public has has thrown down on our side here, but certainly in among Latinos, a majority of Latinos find the phraseology uh, offensive. Uh, there is data that the National Hispanic Media Coalition has uncovered through a poll, for example, that shows that uh, most Latinos, more than 60% of Latinos, find that the word is used against them unfairly and only used against them, hardly ever applied to white immigrants, for example, who are in the same situation. So uh, among Latinos, definitely a very strong feeling. And among the American public, I think clearly there is changing use. We have uh, been tracking, for example, news outlets that reprint AP stories but edit that word out. So this is already a change that many, many local news outlets have begun to make already. ABC News has made it. The Huffington Post has made it. So the Associated Press, is, their decision comes on the heels of changing practice in newsrooms. At the time of uh, this taping, the New York Times has yet to drop the, the word. How surprising is it that uh, a publication like that uh, is not fast to embrace the change. The New York Times is known to be slow to embrace these changes. Early on in our campaign, I met with Gloria Steinem and I asked her about the process that the women's movement went through to get the words Miss and Mrs. replaced with the word Ms. in newspapers. And Gloria Steinem told me that the New York Times was the last to make the change. All these local tiny outlets had already shifted. And so they tend to be a little bit slower to make these changes. They are considering it right now. So this is a very good time for your viewers to give a call or drop a note to the New York Times and urge them to make the shift themselves. What about the alternative words that can be used to replace the word illegal? There's a little bit of uh, worry or concern on the part of journalists and politicians of what would be the correct word to, to replace illegal. Right. We are comfortable using the words undocumented and also the word unauthorized. But what we really urge people to do is drill down in their reporting to really describe the person's situation. The Associated Press will still use the word illegal. They will just use it to describe the action rather than the person. And that is, the pr that is what we've been pressing for, is not to have a human being's entire identity become tied only to this one action. And so people can use it to describe the action or to describe the person. They can say undocumented or unauthorized. Uh, and they can always say that this is a person who is a Mexican national who crossed the border in the very specific ways uh, or entered the country in the very specific ways that they did. Some people have issue, take issue with the word undocumented as well. Uh, do you think it will all boil down to a consensus on, on what is the most appropriate word to use? I don't know that there will be a consensus, and I don't think that there needs to be a consensus. I think the uh, what we've always said is that we're not trying to hide what anybody has done. We're very clear about the decisions that people have made in our own reporting and about the consequences that they face for, for those decisions. So uh, news outlets will use a different range of words unauthorized for people who don't find undocumented to be appropriate. It seems to me that unauthorized is very, very clear about what the problem is. And um, But in, in many cases, folks will just uh, describe the actions in a way that feels comfortable for them and describe the person as an aspiring immigrant or as a would-be immigrant or as someone who would like to be an immigrant uh, or as an unauthorized immigrant. That's, those are all great options. The Center for American Progress has recently published a study according to which children are beginning to view immigration as equivalent to illegal because of the use of that word. What are your thoughts on that, Rinko? Well, clearly the word has had enormous effect on the American public and how it thinks about immigrants. I saw another study that noted that a majority of Americans think that most Latinos, U.S. Latinos, are undocumented immigrants. 
So the slippage between, you know, the people who actually are out of status and all of the other people who look like they could be out of status, that is a very racialized judgment that folks make. And that they have that racialized image of undocumented immigrants because of the many years of having it pounded into their heads that um, someone who is quote unquote illegal is a Latino. That, that simply is the way that the debate has gone down. So it's not at all surprising that uh, Americans would think that most immigrants are undocumented and certainly that most immigrants of color are undocumented and that Latinos, whether born in the US, citizens, green card holders, whatever their status, that most of them are, um, are out of status. Rinko Sen, thank you for being in studio with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Still to come on the show, the city's ethnic diaspora to come alive on the airwaves. Before that, Sarah Pizon has some other news. Thanks, Viranara. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic and community media. It's a sign of economic recovery. The Irish Central reports that for the first time since 2008, the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services has reached its annual H-1B work visa cap in just five days, compared to a month last year. The USCIS said it received more than 124,000 applications in its first week and has stopped accepting petitions. It will resort to an H-1B lottery system to select the 85,000 recipients for fiscal year 2014. The paper says the rise in the number of applicants reflects a growing demand for hiring foreign skilled workers in the U.S. The ongoing financial crisis in Greece has turned many Greeks into Brooklynites. According to a report in the Brooklyn Inc., Greeks of all ages are fleeing their country's record unemployment of 27 percent to land jobs in Coney Island. The International Monetary Fund reports that Greece's gross domestic product decreased by 6 percent last year and forced many to immigrate elsewhere to find a better financial situation. No reliable data about this new wave of Greek immigration to the U.S. is yet available, but reports published in other countries reveal a real trend. LDR La Prensa reports that residents of the South Bronx recently held an after-school rally to support the Day of Love and Action for the approval of immigration reform. The rally was organized by La Fuente, a grassroots organization in the Bronx. It was meant for those who could not attend the larger march in Washington, D.C. This comes at a time when a bipartisan plan is being worked on in the U.S. Senate as labor and business leaders are working out final details for a guest worker program. Rising rent in northern Manhattan is leading to a revolving door for some small businesses in the neighborhood. The Manhattan Times reports that restaurants and grocery stores in Washington Heights and Inwood have no choice but to close up shop. Business owners say small businesses have always been part of this community and are saddened by the change. But they also say it's more than gentrification. They are being replaced by national chain stores. And finally, from Amsterdam News, the best U.S. public high school is in New York City. A new report by the bestschools.org TBS ranks Bronx High School of Science the best of its kind, saying it attracts intellectually gifted students from diverse cultural, ethnic, and economic backgrounds. TBS's ranking comes after carefully reviewing each school's ACT and SAT scores, GPAs, and the Academic Performance Index. None of the other eight specialized schools in New York City were listed in the report. Those were just a few stories from the ethnic and community media. Independent sources will return right after this.
Where I'm From is a live onstage radio show that will feature talents from New York City's ethnic and immigrant populations. The show is being staged by CUNY's Graduate School of Journalism and will be held at Webster Hall. The show's host and senior producer, Jesse Hardman, and I spoke about the program. Jesse, uh, tell us about the show. Uh, you bring in together voices from the diaspora. What's the purpose? What do you want to accomplish with a show like that? Well, um, it kind of starts a long time ago for me, the concept behind the show. Um, I train reporters in different countries, and I found myself in Sri Lanka for about a year. And I went there with a, a certain concept of what radio should sound like, and I was working with local reporters there, and what came back at, at me was, no, <laughs> actually, radio sounds like this. It was very different than I was used to. So, For instance, what does uh, it sound like? Well, you might hear like a two-minute interview, but the radio station we worked with um, would require three Bollywood songs in between each <laughs> two minutes of information, and that's just how people listen there. Um, so there's this kind of um, attempt by public media in, in the United States to draw in a more diverse audience. And the idea is I think what they're missing is people listen very differently depending on where they're from. So I thought what better than to invite people from those communities to do their thing, to share their talents, to share their wisdom, and get an audience you know, from that by hearing them. Yeah. And give us a sense of production-wise, how it's going to go. Uh, it's going to be at Webster Hall, mm -hmm. and when people come there, what happens? Well, so uh, the idea to do it live is just radio is better when it's live. It's more active. You know, you're involving the audience. So we're going to tape the show, which will be a live show, and then produce it afterwards. Um, and it's a mixture of musicians, of writers, of we have a chef from the Bronx who's Bengali. Um, people from all over the world, every continent and every borough other than Staten Island will be there. Yeah. Staten Island, is that New York Yeah, we've got to work on them <laughs> for the next show. Maybe some Sri Lankans or Liberians, yeah. Okay. And, and, and so uh, what would the chef do, for instance? Well, so he's going to share some recipes from his grandmother back in Dhaka. Mm -hmm. um, and so I tasted it the other night. It's these kind of these mashes that you make out of different herbs and fish and you eat them with rice and we're going to show how to eat with your right hand which if you're from south asia well muslim countries in general you're not supposed to use uh, yeah uh, well so you uh with the left hand no with the right <laughs> hand it's how do you uh so I, when i lived in sri lanka i had to learn how to eat with my hand my right hand so we're going to teach people how to do that i um, mean it's a little bit there's a reason for it i mean i don't know if the if we want to share that the reason with the audience you want to tell the audience why you're not supposed to use your left hand well because you use your left hand in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I, I learned that the hard way in, in, in Senegal oh, yeah. when I, I'm kind of lefty. Oh, so yeah. I went to pay the taxi driver with, with my left hand, and he was insulted. Yeah, you have to be <laughs> careful. There's lots of ways to offend people, depending on where you are. So this is a, I guess, in a way, this is you know, why you're doing this show, because in you know, New York you encounter all different cultures, and you have to really know how to interact with these cultures. Sure, if you go up to Queens, to Astoria, and you're walking around, uh, you know, on Steinway, you're going to start in Egypt, you're going to hit Mexico, and at some point you're probably going to wind up in Eastern Europe. Um, and you might be walking, you're not really picking up all of the things that are around you, but there's all these amazing, talented people living in these neighborhoods, and they rarely get invited, you know, to be broadcast. And so I think it's really important. This is a majority-minority country now, <laughs> and if we don't invite those voices on, we're missing actually who lives here. Especially in the city. Totally. And, uh, you know, for instance, all over the country, I'm from Minneapolis, from Minnesota. Um, if you live there, you are very familiar with the Hmong who come from Laos, or it's the main diaspora of Somalis. Mm -hmm. So there's been this whole education process in a city like Minneapolis um, of those cultures. The Somalis are Muslim. There hadn't been Muslims in Minnesota before. So there's all these things to learn and all these people to meet. And rarely do we invite them, you know, sure. to kind of be part of our media. So on Saturday, who's going to be there? Are you, would you have musicians as well? Yes, Artists? we've got a, a great Congolese musician, Isaac Katale, and his band. Uh, our big guest. Is he a Sukus uh, player? Uh, yeah, among other things. Yeah, he's a great drummer. Okay. Um, very high energy, so he'll be there. Um, we have a Colombian musician um, named Diego Obregón. <laughs> And he makes his own marimbas out of palm, so he's going to play the instrument that he makes at home. Um, and he comes from the Pacific coast of Colombia, and he has his own kind of style of music. And the big guest is um, 
somebody most people might know by now, Jose Antonio Vargas. He's a journalist. Uh, journalist and uh, um, one of the, the bigger activist. voices. <laughs> yeah, one <laughs> of the bigger voices for the undocumented, you know, for immigration reform. And he himself came out as undocumented in the New York Times. So he'll be there to talk about what he's been learning and what the latest is with, with legislation. Um, we have our Bengali chef. We have a Russian poet um, who's a mental health worker. And she's going to talk about what are the struggles for immigrants when they come here in terms of, of mental health. So hopefully it'll be a show that's entertaining, but also has information that people will take away mm -hmm. and, and is useful to them. You know, maybe you'll hear about some resources you weren't aware of. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where is it going to be air? Um, so we're still figuring that out. Um, but we're going to produce an hour mm -hmm. segment out of, out of the two-hour show. So put together the best parts and market it to different public radio stations. Um, there's a ton of them out there. And we have relationships with some of them through our radio program here at CUNY's J School. Now, how did you put the program together? How did you decide on, on these specific artists? Was there a rhyme or reason for that? Um, I've spent the last two and a half months going all over the city to the end of every subway line, um, going to concerts, visiting restaurants, sitting down and having coffee with people and just kind of exploring who's out there. So I got tips from friends from different nonprofits. There's a lot of great nonprofits here who support um, diaspora communities and musicians and artists. So I talked to them. Um, there's a very famous uh, ethnomusicologist mm -hmm. named Alan Lomax. Uh, he's now deceased, but his NGO is a few blocks from here. And we worked with them a little bit. His big thing was kind of finding these same um, talented people out there in neighborhoods um, around the city. What, what time does it start and how do we get, how can people want to get yeah, yeah. there? So we have a website, it's called whereimfromshow.com. Okay. And the show starts at 3 p.m. at Webster Hall near Union Square. Uh, there'll be food, music, um, there's a bar. So it should be a fun time, people will be dancing. It, how much is it to get in? Uh, if you go online through our website, it's five bucks and at the door it's ten. And um, yeah, the proceeds go back to the performers. So we're trying to create a, you know, an opportunity for the people we invite as well. Okay. Yeah. Well, it sounds like it's going to be a great time. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited, and I hope to see everybody. Well, on that note, we leave it there. Thank you very much, Jesse. Good luck with the show. Thanks, Gary. When we come back, bringing affordable style to Harlem in an innovative way. My name's Reggie. Just recently, my wife and I took in her sister's children. And we already had four, so I went from becoming a family man to a man with a bigger family. <clears throat> now, you can't eat love, so I don't know how I'm going to feed them tonight. How was that, Reggie? I think I look more like Denzel. <laughs> That's cold, man. Play a role in ending hunger. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank. And finally from us, we know that New York is one of the fashion centers of the world and every day you walk down the street, someone's wearing something that turns heads. Well, Nika Green Ingram is turning heads in her own way up in Harlem. Producer Mingling Huang filed this report on the former bus driver turned entrepreneur. If you like shopping Harlem, the big chain stores are no longer your only choices. And Nika Green Ingram a 36-year-old U.S. Navy veteran, takes advantage of the booming truck storefront trend in New York City. But instead of selling food, she's serving up style in a former Cheetos delivery truck that is now called Celebrities Mobile Boutique. You know, I love women when they look good, and I'm like, wow. You know, and when we think celebrities, we think fabulous. We think red carpet. We think bling. So I just brought all that to one business. Greenham started City's first mobile boutique last November after she saw one in Los Angeles. The truck parks on the highly trafficked 125th Street. The boutique offers an array of trendy costume jewelry, accessories, apparel, and a small section of men's items. 
Well, at first they were skeptical of coming into the truck because it is so new. And because, you know, we live in New York, so everybody's like kind of scared to, of the unknown. But now they're like, they can't believe it. They can't believe that it looks so beautiful and they love it. Green, sparkles, diamonds, glitter, gold. It's beautiful. Even though it's small, you can fit so much stuff in everything. This is beautiful. I'm walking down 105th Street. And a young lady asked me to come in, so I came in. What I like the store. Hopefully when I come back next week, you'll be here. Yes. You all be here next Saturday? I'll be here. So you can actually get the whole celebrity's experience because my uh, slogan is where everyone is treated like a star, which means you come here and you could just, you bring your shoes and you could walk away with everything else. <laughs> the pricing also makes the place irresistible. Every piece of accessories here costs between $5 to $35. Many of the items come from local designers in Brooklyn, Harlem, and the Bronx. Greeny Graham says she fell in love with fashion when she was still an MTA bus driver. Even though all she did was sit behind the steering wheel, she always accessorized her uniform with jewelry, makeup, and eyelashes. Because I was a city bus operator for 13 years and I'm riding up and down on the streets of Harlem, I got to see that, you know, their fashion sense and, you know, how they were following what celebrities were wearing anyway. And Harlem is big with following trends and they love fashion. So I thought this is the place to be. Despite its popularity among customers, celebrities' low cost business model is a concern for some of the traditional shops. They worry that it will start a trend of mobile shops in the neighborhood. But the Greenogram says she's going to view it positively. They are afraid that other brick and mortar stores are going to suffer. And that's why as celebrities, we try to support local businesses, the up and coming entrepreneurs, because the big stores, they're not going to accept people like celebrities inside of their stores to, you know, sell. So I think that it's a great idea for me to be here. So not only am I representing myself, but I'm representing other businesses. When the weather gets warmer, Greeny Graham plans on hitting the road around the New York City and all the way to North Carolina. A many one for independent sources. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded.